Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Chronicles Magazine podcast. I'm here today with Brian McClanahan, and we're going to talk about a subject that's near and dear to Brian's heart, of course. Most of you know him probably as a great defender and proponent of the South and the Southern culture and Southern history. And Brian, you suggested this date to me because it's actually historically been um, Confederate History Month. So maybe just talk about, about that, and um, are you allowed to celebrate uh, the South anymore? <laughs> Uh, well, I guess you're allowed to celebrate the South as long as you're doing it in the right way. And it's approved. The approved way to celebrate the South would be that you have to uh, be very critical of it, right? So, uh, but no, April is uh, called Confederate uh, History Month or Confederate Heritage Month you know, in a lot of states. And of course, it's the month that uh, Lee surrenders and, um, in 1865. And uh, it's also the, the beginning of the war. And I think that's why it was chosen for that, for that particular reason. Um, I think in some ways it's kind of a, a, a sad way to look at it. You know, if you really want to celebrate uh, the the Confederacy or at least the principles behind self-determination, you should go back and look at maybe December or January or, you know, during secession winter. But regardless, uh, you know, it's always been a month that people have talked about Lee and Jackson and uh, some of the things that, uh, you know, the Confederacy was uh, was famous for, the military exploits, the heroes, the the, uh, the the Constitution, which is a really interesting part in American constitutionalism, uh, we could talk about that a little bit. But um, we we've forgotten who these people are. I mean, if if you look at uh, the importance of Lee or Jackson, just take those two individuals. I, I remember I used to tell this story all the time in my in my parents' home. They had a calendar up on the wall for my dad's birth year, nineteen forty. And on that calendar was a Northern Insurance Company. It had in January. It had both Lee and Jackson's birthday that on the calendar that everybody should be remembering and celebrating. Here we have these two great Americans that were worthy of emulation. And for conservatives in America, you know, you had someone like E.L. Godkin, who certainly wasn't a Southern partisan, but someone who, uh, in, in fact, wrote in favor of the Union during the war. He's a Union course, uh, correspondent. He was a journalist. And But when Jackson died, he called him a purely an American character, someone that everybody in the United States should should celebrate because of his character, his piety, his devotion to the cause, his heroism. I mean, these are things that were important principles. Those things mattered. So uh, when you look at um, April and what we should be looking at in terms of emulating in the South, you know, Lee and Jackson are always there. When I wrote my Politically Incorrect Guide to Real American Heroes, I had a chapter on Lee and Jackson. And mm -hmm. uh, if, if this was, you know, 30 years ago, that would have been seen as, yeah, that's that's normal. Nowadays, of course, when you say these things, you're some kind of alien coming from another planet because how dare you say anything positive about these horrible Southerners? And I think that shows you it's 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 it exemplifies where we are in America that Anything that's traditional, particularly in the South, cannot be celebrated. Well, it's funny because, you know, like you said, even 30 years ago, my, I, I was just talking to my father-in-law about this. When he was in school, I mean, this was this was post-60. So this was after things started to change, the narrative started to change. But he was always taught that Jackson was a good man. He was worthy of emulation. Um, these, these, contra these regional controversies are something that's part of who we are. And the men that led them were part of a particular situation. Um, and they are worthy of us looking back to them and learning something from them. But, you know, nowadays we have this idea of the South that it's actually like an exception. It's, it's not, it's not fully American somehow it's like anti-American. And so part of understanding American history is by definition, excluding the South, maybe talk about how American the South actually is. Well, that's actually really Big question. And um, I was just doing something. I recorded a, a podcast for the Abbeville Institute today. And it was a it was a an essay from 1932 by Donald Davidson. And he pointed this out in 1932. The South was something different. And he he, he talked about it in terms of northern progressivism. This was a, a process by which the North was trying to, of course, remake America in the post-war period, 1865 up to that point. I mean, 1932, we're not very far removed from, from the war. It was still very fresh in people's minds. And he was thinking about these things in terms of modernity and industrialization and all the issues that people were wrestling with now in, in the early 20th century. But there was a recent book as well on John C. Calhoun titled American Heretic. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a decent biography. Uh, there are some positives to it. But when you think about that title that 
Calhoun would be some type somehow heretical to the American order, or Calhoun was some type, somehow on the outside looking in. The South had that kind of, or at least nowadays has that kind of, of reputation. But I would say, and I've said this before, if you would ask this question before 1861, the South would have been the American symbol. I mean, you think about who was distinctively American in the late 18th century, the early 19th century. If you went to Europe and said, okay, give me the two most important Americans, they would pick probably Benjamin Franklin, I mean, at least at one point, who's not Southern, but then George Washington's going to be the guy. I mean, George Washington has a statue in London. Right. Right? So people thought about George Washington as the symbol of America. Well, George Washington can't be George Washington without the South. He is a Southern gentleman. Mm -hmm. Thomas Jefferson, and I've said this as well, Thomas Jefferson's first inaugural address is the most important inaugural address in the history of the United States because it outlines a program by which we're going to see the next, next 24 years, next three presidencies really try to fit that. And then even after that, even Lincoln is talking about Jefferson, not Washington. He's talking about Jefferson. His foreign policy, his domestic policy, all of these things are wrapped into this very Jeffersonian vision of what America was. If you look at pop culture, someone like Daniel Boone, uh, who um, was you know nominally Southern, but of course helped found Kentucky, but still this coonskin cap, this frontiersman, you know, David Crockett, Texas, these are the things that people thought about when they thought about America in the antebellum period, it was this rugged individualism that the South really exemplified. And you had Southern leaders that really personified that, that narrative. And then, of course, when you think about Calhoun and you really get into what Calhoun was saying, Calhoun wasn't, you could say he's a, sec, a Southern sectionalist, but he really was a unionist. He said it his entire life. I'm for the union the way it was designed. Mm -hmm. I believe in the United States as a federation of states. And we all have, we all benefit from the union. We all are burdened by the union equally. He wasn't someone that was interested only in the South. So that, and, and he wasn't heretical. And in fact, that book makes this case, the American heretic says, look, Calhoun, when he says mm -hmm. some of the things that he does in the 1840s, uh, in the 1830s, these would have been generally accepted as American positions until we get to the war. And that's when you see the break. The mm -hmm. South no longer can offer a critique of American society. It can no longer be seen as something that's part of American society. It now has to be the other because we're seeing a shift and the North becomes the dominant narrative. You know, we have the pilgrims instead of Jamestown. That becomes when America is founded, 1620, not 1607. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, it's 1619, which is a complete, I mean, just a whole nother rail in and of itself in some ways, though it does believe in Lincoln's proposition nation myth. That's a whole nother <laughs> episode. But <laughs> you have this, you, you have this narrative that shifts. You know, the most important founders are not uh, Jefferson and Washington. Unless we can make them honorary Yankees, it's John Adams. And that's because of the Adams family and everything they did. For conservatives, they're going to look at the Adams. They're going to look at Henry Adams and John Adams and these people that we're writing in the in the post bellum era, John Adams, of course, early, but then after the war is over, all the Adams family members that were pretty prominent writers and good writers. I mean, it wasn't mm -hmm. that they were they were poor poor authors, and they had a lot of, of good interesting things to say, but they certainly wanted to shift the focus away from the South and onto how important their family was in the founding of America, so or the founding of the United States. But I mean that that shift, that heretical shift, is something that took place after the war, not before the war. Before the war, we can say the South really was the section that people thought about when they conceptualized what America was or when they tried to have a picture of it. What mm -hmm. was it? Well, it's it's really the South, not necessarily uh, New England. You might make a case maybe from North New York, Pennsylvania, you could, could shade into that, but certainly not New England. But that's how we think of it nowadays. Yeah, let me ask you a, a, a sort of a personal question to pivot into how we think of the South. But do you do you sense, I mean, I mean, first of all, what got you interested in, you know, spending your career doing this? And did you sense any, like, was, when I think of the South and Southern people today, there's a sort of a sense, sort of a self-hatred, you know, that's that's been pushed on them by the North. Did you ever sense any of that? Or did you repudiate that from the beginning? Or like, what what made you do what you do? Um, well, I, I, uh, I was born in Virginia um, and I went to, to a university in, in Maryland and I had a uh, Salisbury University in Maryland. I had a professor there and I'm not, I mean, he, he still teaches there, 
He wrote a really good book on Maryland in the war. And he was always interested in the Southern tradition. That's how I got started in it. I mean, it was, I never really had this concept of, uh, you know, being uh, this, this Southern tradition or what I was. I mean, I grew up in a very conservative family, uh, not necessarily self-loathing. They just accepted things as they are. And I think that's something that you have to understand. People that just accept things as they are generally tend to uh, not have this kind of self-hate. It's like, okay, well, this is what things are. Okay, we'll just go along with it. But or get whatever it is. Um, but uh, this professor at Salisbury was was instrumental in, in getting me interested in, in the Southern tradition and Southern history. And then, of course, I went to South Carolina and worked with Clyde Wilson for my graduate degrees, master's and PhD. So uh, that definitely had an influence. And, and um, I actually, at one point, wanted to uh, potentially work with Forrest McDonald at Alabama. And I went and met with him. Of course, a lot of conservatives are aware of who he, is, he, who he was, very important conservative historian. Loved Hamilton. He would. He hated Jefferson. Loved Hamilton. Mm -hmm. uh, but he told me to go work with Clyde because of what I wanted to do. So um, my interest at, at that point was more in the war. Um, I wrote my dissertation on a Delaware, a senator from Delaware who was pro-Southern, uh, was interested in the secession of Delaware. And um, I, I'd lived in Delaware for about 10 years before I went to, to college in Maryland. So um, I was interested in that state. And that kind of upper South in that, that area where I grew up was, was more interesting to me than the other parts of the South. But then as I went to graduate school and, and took classes with Clyde and, and reading seminars, I mean, his classes were wonderful. Um, he would have you read Will Rogers. Now I would be hard pressed to, to find probably anybody else in it nowadays in particular in the Academy that's going to have their students read Will Rogers uh, in, a, in a graduate seminar. I mean, it was things like that. And of course, his American historiog historiography course was just fantastic. He really he got a, a really in-depth study of who these people were writing American history um, and how the distortions took place. I mean, this was really interesting and important. So that that formulated, that was a very important part of my life in terms of how I thought about uh, the South and, and, and history. And then it just went from there. Um, mm -hmm. And and as I've as I've gotten along in my career, it's been something that's I, I've enjoyed doing. I've always liked doing uh, the Constitution more than anything else. I think at this point, but uh, Southern tradition, Southern culture, you know, Southern history is, is something that I like to do as well. Yeah. So, when you think about the founding and the Constitution, would you consider that a you know because the Constitution is is seen by the many in the South as sort of a centralizing document, um, and yet after the Constitution there was a particular understanding of it that actually did cater to the claims of the Southern tradition against the centralizers. The constitution is much more of a decentralized document. Maybe interact with that dynamic. Sure. I mean, I think if you look at the constitution as ratified, it's not, I mean, it, it certainly strengthened the powers of the central government, but it wasn't a centralizing document. In fact, that's how it was sold to the States. If you go back and read the Virginia ratification uh, convention, um, and you look at what Patrick Henry was saying about it. Of course, he's making all these accusations. It's going to do X, Y, and Z and destroy the Federation of States. And the answer was, no, it won't. It can't. It, it can't because it doesn't have those powers. And it's not, it doesn't create a national government. That was explicitly rejected. And you see this throughout the whole ratification period, North and South. Everyone's talking about that. In mm -hmm. fact, I think if you look at, and we often focus on the anti-federalists, and I think that's wrong. You have to focus on those that ratified the document. Mm -hmm in terms of getting what the thing means. But if you look at it as a whole, if you just kind of say, okay, let's take all the material that was written at that time. You've got th those in favor of the Constitution, North and South, those against it, North and South, and you put it together. And what you would say is that a majority of Americans didn't want a centralized national government. Even those that ratified the document weren't interested in that. That's why some of them, like John Dickinson, who was in favor of ratification, moved against it. And he Later, was a northerner. He was a northerner. John Dickens. Well, he had a, he had a plantation. His, his final home was in Delaware, and that's that. So I have a connection there. But uh, he had a plantation in Delaware. His, his properties were burned in Pennsylvania during the during the uh, American War for Independence. But um, it's just one example of someone who would say, "Okay, I, I'm a Federalist in this period of time." But once it's once we've got the Constitution, oops, wait a second here. This thing is a little bit. We're going further than what we said, so he's going to move into a different camp. Mm -hmm. There were lots of people like that that mm -hmm. were in favor of it and then thought, ah, you know, I, you all are going off the rails here. We're going too far in what we said we were going to do. We're not we don't we didn't create this strong central authority that can nationalize everything. 
That wasn't the point. Um, even if you look at Washington's farewell address, which is very, very famous, he talks about the need to have a national university because we had this real decentralized federation that nobody was really thinking in terms of nationalism. So it proves a lot of things. You know, uh, Randolph uh, in Virginia, Edmund Randolph, favored ratification because Virginia could just be an independent country. He thought that was going to be a disaster. He, he thought if Virginia goes it alone, which there was some discussion, well, that's going to destroy Virginia. So um, certainly I mean, when you look at the Southern founders, they were all very much in line with, I mean, say all, there were exceptions, but pretty much to, to a man, they were in line with this idea that we're going to have a decentralized federation of states. The central government is going to have some powers that it, or at least strengthening some of the powers that it had, but it couldn't really operate on very well. And so we're going to make this a little better, a little stronger union, but it's still a union of states. And so when you get to the 1860s and you talk about secession or even the 1830s or any time before that, I mean, you've got Northerners talking about secession as early as 1794. And this is, people were talking about it all the time. So they all understood that the states had powers. The states had ultimate control of this of this government. Heck, they can abolish it if they choose to do so. It's in that's in the Constitution. They can pass amendments abolishing the whole thing. There was some discussion of that. So, if you go back and look at the record, there's no way you can come away with a with a nationalist understanding of the Constitution unless you want to willfully misrepresent the sources, which is what people have done, like Joseph Story and others. I mean, that's again probably a whole other conversation, but. Um, certainly that willful misrepresentation is what we're dealing with when we talk about nationalism v. federalism. Um, in the Civil War, I mean, of course, went a long way to solidifying, um, you know, the centralized view of things. Uh, but what, what role did the 14th Amendment play and does it still play today? Oh, gosh, it is the Constitution now. Yeah. I mean, there, it, we, <laughs> we have a 14th Amendment Constitution and, and the left is now open about this. For a long time, they would say, ah, no, the 14th Amendment is part of it, but we still the original Constitution supports what we're arguing. You've got leftists now that say, well, no, you, all you conservatives that are originalists and you talk about this decentralized federal republic and all these powers, that's all true. That was all true, but it all died in 1865 or during the war, and then we got the 14th Amendment. Now we have this new United States. Look at Eric Foner, his, his, his newest book. Essentially, it, it says that very thing. Um, and you're, there's others that are doing this now, saying, look, all right, we we know that Southerners or at least originalist conservatives, doesn't matter if you're in the South or not, you're conservative, you're right. You were all right the whole time. And then we got the 14th Amendment. Everything changed. Isn't that great? Um, you know, Randy Barnett, a conservative uh, legal scholar, he's written a book on the 14th Amendment re recently. And when you have people like, you know, James Oaks and Eric Foner praising your book, you might want to rethink if it's really, really that conservative. Right. Um, and that's who's doing it, right? So the, these are the James Oaks loves this book by Randy Barnett on the 14th Amendment. Mm -hmm. And of course, looking at the 14th Amendment, the best book you can ever read on this is Raoul Berger's Government by Judiciary and his follow up book, uh, the 14th Amendment, which answers all the critics. But um, I, I don't think that there's any question that the 14th Amendment changes everything, not because it was designed to do that but because that's how the courts have interpreted it to do that. So um, it, it's another situation where the courts have gotten involved, the federal court system, and it's completely distorted the way we think about uh, American governments and American constitutionalism. Let's talk about conservatism and ideology. I mean, Chronicles um, has been, you know, it, it is the classic paleoconservative outlet, but their conservatism means something much more rooted and realist um, than idealist. Um, which I guess in your mind is much more consistent with the Southern understanding of conservatism compared to what we might call neoconservatism. Uh, maybe interact with that. Absolutely. I mean, you, I don't think you could be a conservative and be an ideologue. It's impossible. Conservative, conservative is based on tradition. And so what is that tradition? That's something we're always wrestling with. In, in, and we were just having a long conversation behind the scenes. We're talking to Chronicles. Paul Gottfried had, I, I did a podcast uh, two days ago, mm -hmm. or it was yesterday. Yesterday, I recorded a company. Two days ago, I recorded it, but yesterday it came out on uh, Paul's, one of his recent uh, pieces in Chronicles. And I raised some of these questions. What is the viable heritage? What are we looking for? And who do we emulate in America? And is there, 
a real American conservative tradition. This is something that people have been talking about now for decades. Mm -hmm. um, and if you, you listen to someone like Louis Hart, he would say there isn't one. And of course, Paul recently has said, well, no, nah, I've come around to thinking that's not true. And some of that is because of the South. I mean, you, you have people like Eugene Genovese, at one time a leftist who very much became sympathetic with the Southern tradition, wrote a very good little book on the Southern tradition, but then his monumental book, The Mind of the Master Class, is just fantastic, where he gets into this really old rooted order in the South, and it wasn't ideological. Mm -hmm. It was things as they are. You go back and look at the 1860s. I, I always I love this speech in the 1860s by a man named Winter Davis of Maryland. Uh, he was a radical Republican, and he's calling his opponents conservatives. Why? Because they wanted things as they are, the Constitution as it is, the Union as it was, and these kind of things. So they're looking at things as they are. Uh, it's not ideological. These Republicans were radical revolutionaries in many ways. And you look mm -hmm. at someone like Dabney in 1871, Women's Rights Women, which is just a funny essay about how all the isms were going to distort America and change everything. You couldn't be a Northern conservative because there wasn't such a thing. They were just accepting the old discarded leftover ideology of the, of the past and using it to be their new conservative talking point. And you look at the neocons, in some cases, even the West Coast Straussians, when you, when you start with Lincoln, you're going to run into problems. And I know this is where people, I mean, I, I irritate people by saying this, but you can't really start with Lincoln as a conservative and be a conservative. He was a 19th century leftist in many ways. Same with the Republican Party. So you got to go back before that. And this is where I'd say you got to look to people like John Randolph of Roanoke or John C. Calhoun or John Taylor of Caroline. These, these Southerners who really embody that, the old Republicans. There's a, there's a really good book on the old Republicans, not sympathetic with them at all. Norman Risdor's The Old Republicans, um, where he gets into this faction of, of Jeffersonians who are really conservative, Nathaniel Macon and people like that, but they're almost exclusively from the South. They had a rooted order. And it wasn't just because of the institution of slavery, which people will start pointing out, well, yes, yeah, because they're all slave owners. No, no, no. The Southern tradition is created, is there before that in so many ways. David Hackett Fisher's Albion Seed talks about this, how that those Anglican traditions or Anglia traditions were brought over and rooted in places like Virginia and the Carolinas. And then you've got the old uh, the, the the low country of South Carolina, which you had other influences from other parts of the Caribbean. And then, of course, you've got over into Louisiana, some of these areas, still a very rooted order of how things were going to work. There's a tradition there. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas when you look at the North, uh, you do have um, a little more innovation taking place. I mean, this is the city upon a hill. This is we have to create something new. What work, What's in England isn't what we like, and we got to have it here something different, something innovative, something new, something uh, that would be uh, different from what we had anywhere else. So it's more utopian. Southerners just liked where they were. I mean, this was yeah. it. You had it, and this is what we're trying to emulate. So I'm, it's a long-winded way of saying that when you look at conservatism in America, I don't think you can get away with not saying the South is really the anchor to all of it. Uh, and that if you if you want to explore it, you have to really go toward the South more than anywhere else. I have a comment here on on the uh, conversation, and I'd like to get you to interact with it. But it basically says that the South inherited, um, you know, traditional English gentry, um, arguing that it was much more of a traditional European society. That's the way they saw themselves compared to the North, which were much more mercantilist and industrial and innovative and forward looking. Uh, maybe con uh, may people don't really think of that um, very often as an aspect of the South. That is that it is an inheritance of old Europe. Yeah, I mean, uh, people talked about it. They would say it has you know, some of the feudal order left in it. Um, I think that's that's questionable whether they consider themselves feudal lords or not. I mean, they were certainly. You look at someone like Calhoun or even uh, you know John Taylor or John Randolph. Um, you wouldn't say they were necessarily anti progress. But they were anti-innovation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> progress for progress sake wasn't something they wanted to do. There, there had to be a very careful consideration of these things. Even Calhoun would say, look, maybe in the future we could have some of these things that all these reformers are pushing for, but it's going to take time. Mm -hmm. it, has to, it has to develop over time. It can't just be immediate or something that's going to take place because we decide today on a whim we're going to do this. 
-hmm. Why is always the question. And you look at Chesterton or somebody in Europe uh, later on, they would ask the same question. Why do we have a fence there? Well, the fence is there for this reason. So should we tear it down or not? These are the questions that Southerners were asking. Um, and yeah, certainly the North was uh, very much more interested ultimately in a different kind of, of political economic system. And the South was something else. Uh, they did think they were Americans, though. And, and this is something else that I think we have to understand. When Jefferson was asked about the Declaration at one point, and you have the very famous all men are created equal, he said, look, I wasn't coming up with anything new there. This is just the expression of the American mind. It's just what we were all thinking at the time. Or, you know, it was, in other words, it was, it was just normal. Um, and it wasn't a, a radical departure from anything they really thought about. It was just things as they are. Um, and and in, when you think about that in an 18th century mind, an Englishman coming off the English Bill of Rights or even the Magna Carta, just go back to 1215. Well, the king is not above the law. If we really do have equality under the law, then that would be something you would say, well, that's just what it is. So, yeah, I mean, are they European or are they American? I think that there's there's certainly a, a rooted order there that they're more be more in line with, say, the gentry of, of Europe than anywhere else. But they certainly are Americans as well. They have view, American views on a lot of things mm -hmm. um, that isn't necessarily European, but they have some of those tendencies in, in that group, certainly in, at least in the upper class in, in, in uh, the South. I have a request here for you to comment on on Jefferson. He's hotly debated about whether he's, you know, a proto-liberal, you know, a, a, a sympathizer with with the French Revolution, or is he a conservative, you know, with his agrarian mm -hmm. mind? Um, well, it depends on who you ask. Again, <laughs> that was actually the gist of the entire conversation we were having uh, just the mm -hmm. last couple of days. Uh, I, I, of course, studied with Clive Wilson. He had a very famous essay in the late '60s where he called Jefferson a conservative. And that was really controversial then. Yeah. Um, and uh, he, there's actually some interesting correspondence about that. After he wrote that, he took a lot of heat. And there were people that were writing him saying, you said the exact, you said the right thing. How could Jefferson be a conservative? In Virginia, I don't think he necessarily was. I mean, you look at Jefferson, the reformer, he's doing things that even people of Virginia would say, they aren't really that conservative. However... He wasn't a radical innovator in that he wasn't someone who was just going to tear everything down to tear it down. Jefferson's vision of reform stopped at his mountains. He wasn't going to tear down Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. He wasn't going to tear down New York. He certainly wasn't going to do anything with Europe. There's actually a really good article at the Abbeville Institute website today on Jefferson and Greece. You had a Greek nationalist email, uh, email him, write him a letter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Here are 20, send him an email, <laughs> write him a letter. And says, hey, Jefferson, can you comment on uh, on this Greek independence thing? You know, we need to come up with the Constitution. Jefferson says, well, Greece is Greece. I can't tell you what to do in Greece. These are the things that I think are important. But you have to do what you have to do in Greece. It'd be better to look at our states as models, not the U.S. Constitution, too big. Look at the states as models and think about those smaller political communities, because that's how you have to think about society. Smaller communities are, of course, are some principles I think you should have. But you got to do what's best for Greece. That was that part of the real Jefferson. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, no, that I interrupted you, but that was, that was part of the context of a separation of church and state comment too, right? Was was just Absolutely. the need for decentralized solutions. Absolutely. I mean, if you think about that Danbury Baptist letter, the, the context of that is important. The Danbury Baptist of Connecticut write Jefferson a letter saying, "You know what? We don't have any religious freedom in Connecticut, and what do you think about that?" They also said, "We know we can't do anything about it from the central government." But we just want your opinion. And Jefferson agrees. He says, yeah, I really can't do anything about that. That's yeah. Connecticut to decide. You're going to have to figure this out in Connecticut. I hope one day you do, because that would be great for you. Mm -hmm. But I can't do anything about that. Virginia can't do anything about that. The general government can't do anything about that. That's for the people of Connecticut to decide. Jefferson's commitment to federalism was his most enduring conservative principle. And it is at the heart of American conservatism. What happens in your state? And your political community is very important, but you have to accept in some ways that some people in some other places are going to do things you don't like. And that's just that. If you go the other way, you're, you're moving into this more reformist mindset that we have to transform everything else to fit our worldview. Now you get very aggressive and imperialistic. And I mean, there are, there's something to be said for that. Like if you're, you're the British and the way you're controlling the world and uh, there, there, there are some benefits to that. 
However, in our model with these divergent political cultures and how we want to, we have, we have a central authority that's trying to govern all this and it has to allow for some movements there. Well, how do you do that and not create all the hostility we see with everyone searching for the center to try to have some solution, one size fits all. Federalism has to be the key and Jefferson recognized that. And whenever he had a chance to try to work in a way that would be more imperialistic, he declined. Mm -hmm. He would just say, no, I can't do that. That's for you to decide. We can work on Virginia here, but you have to decide where you are, the path you're going to take. That's Jefferson, the conservative. And I think that's where we have to get into this, this discussion. Jefferson, the philosopher. Yeah. I mean, why well, he, he thought the French revolution was okay. Actually, he thought, I mean, when it got real bad, he, he, he recoiled at it a little bit. And, um, but even late in his life, he was asked, you know, Illinois was proposing to have uh, slavery. And Jefferson said, you don't, he was silent on it. You have to decide what you're going to do in Illinois. I'm not going to tell you what to do there. Yeah. Um, so Jefferson realized that there was there was only, there were limits on things, and those limits are important in conservatism. You know, that's an important part of of what it means to be conservative. There are natural limits to things, and you can only go so far, and then you start to wreck stuff, and then what's the collateral damage? You saw little flickers of. Um revival of, on the topic of nullification when Abbott was uh, kind of doing a small standoff on the immigration issue, the border issue. Um, so sometimes we forget about the importance of nullification and, and strikes, uh, states initiative, state sovereignty, but there are times when it becomes, you know, much more important and obvious and it's always sitting there available for us to grasp. Um, how much do you think the conservative movement needs to latch onto these themes in the future? I think it's essential. Um, and I'll say this 20 years ago, uh, in, in the nineties or even now almost 30 years ago, this would have been unheard of to be having these discussions. Uh, nullification was not really talked about at all. It'd been pretty much buried because of the civil rights movement. People had looked at it with such, you know, disdain because it was used there to defend something that uh, most Americans wouldn't support. But nowadays, People are using it for all kinds of reasons, things that conservatives support, things that people on the left support. And this is, again, where you where you have a little discussion, the conservative side of things. You know, you have someone like Victor, Victor Davis Hanson who would say, well, this is just everything's being Confederate. Right. We we have these sanctuary cities and we got we got states doing this stuff. And because these things are on the left, he's not going to support it. On the other hand. We need to be thinking about this stuff on both sides, right? If California wants to be California, we should let California do it. Mm -hmm. Because in so many ways, it's allowed for people to say, hey, look how bad these cities are in California. Do we want that here? Uh, look at what just happened in Portland. They've legalized everything there. And now they're starting to say, hey, maybe that was a bad idea. We need to, we need to start funding the police again and criminalizing stuff that isn't really that good. So... Let them have their little experiments and, and they can be really bad. Uh, now, there is, again, collateral damage. That. There's conservatives in California. There's conservatives in Oregon. There, there are people out there that are going to be harmed by this. And that's that's hard for us to reconcile. But you have to, th this nullification thing has to be important. The states have powers. And if the states can check the center, if they can show conclusively, which they always can, that the center, the emperor has no clothes, then we're in a much better situation in America for anything conservatives would want, anything the left would want. You know, it's remarkable after the Dobbs decision and people were going crazy about this. I mean, you had all the protests and Cal we're going to protest this. But they all finally realized, hey, you know what? California hasn't changed one minute. Right. It hasn't done anything. California is still doing everything. It's still operating as California. The only thing that changed is some states are now having these discussions. That's it. And all of that kind of died down from a national clamor on these things because the left realized, hey, it's still OK in all the states that we want it to be OK. in. now we can put pressure on other states to do other things. And the right started figuring out, you know, in our states that we control, we can try to do some things with that, too. So it's it really has, I think, in some ways, silenced some of the vitriol on that particular issue, at least on a on a national, quote unquote, scale. Mm -hmm. Um it's amazing how that works. You have this principle of federalism and states can, people can do what they want. And wow, it, it lessens the tension a little bit. It creates a safety valve. So um, I, nullification, interposition, whatever you want to call it, state powers, it has to be there. 
because that's the only way we're going to maintain this federal union and not have it crack under the pressure of 50 plus 1 percent, the numeric, this very small numerical majority that Calhoun, of course, was warning about when he wrote, uh, talked in his speeches and, of course, wrote his dis disquisition and discourse uh, published right after he died. Mm -hmm. In the 80s and 90s, there was a standoff between Mel Bradford and Harry Jaffa. Why was that important? Well, what was it? And why is it important to remember that? Well, actually, the standoff began in the 1970s. Jaffa wrote a piece on a law review uh, on equality as a conservative principle. And it was um, a critique of a book by Wilmore Kendall, uh, The Basic Symbols of America. Um, and um, he said, look, here's the problem. These guys are attacking Lincoln far too much. Now, Jaffa, of course, had written Crisis of a House Divided, and uh, he had been very pro-Lincoln. But he, he responds to this book, this, this Kendall book, with extreme disdain. I mean, he's saying, look, Lincoln, you can't bash Lincoln uh, because Lincoln is the epitome of American conservatism. He is it. And these things he says about secession, these things he says about equality, all that stuff is important. Now, when you think about why Jaffa would have done something like that, you, know, you think of the 1970s, where were we? Ken, uh, Wilmore Kendall could have been accused of being an, a fascist or a racist. In fact, he was. I mean, people were leveling the, you know, these accusations against him. And even Jaffa uses this kind of language. Mm -hmm. So what he's trying to do, I think, is play off and say, no, no, no. American conservatives have never been these things. These are these outliers. American conservatives have always been interested in these very, these ideas of equality and and uh, he's trying to deflect the charges. And you could understand it in the 1970s. In other words, he's trying to appease the left and saying, no, we're not, we're not these bad guys that everybody says we are. Not, not understanding that they're going to make those charges against Harry Jaffa, too. I mean, mm -hmm. it would have happened, right? So then Bradford responds with his own, uh, his own uh, article on this, and he rips it apart. And he, he, he tears down Lincoln. Um, and of course, he says he's influenced by Kendall in that situation. He knows that he's read it and uh, he, he understands that maybe they've influenced him more than, than he realizes. But um, you can't say equality is a conservative principle. That's a distortion of the term. And so then when you get to the 1980s, Ronald Reagan's elected in 1980 and they're searching for appointees. And there's a there's a proposal to have Bradford appointed as the chairman of the NEH. And uh, you have Bill Bennett throw a fit. Bill Bennett, George Will, they don't want a guy that's anti-Lincoln uh, having that kind of power over grants and other things. I mean, what could he have done? He could have you know, made Heritage Foundation a real conservative organization. You think about that. <laughs> what could have happened if Bradford had that kind of control, uh, the, these kind of grants and other things? So that would have been fantastic. But he's withdrawn and you get uh, a neocon put in his place. Now, Jaffa, it's important to note, actually supported Bradford's candidacy for that. Uh, Jaffa right. saw Bradford as someone who was worthy of having that position. He was a real intellectual. He understood things. He wasn't these weirdo neoconservatives running around that you know, the Crystals and the Bennetts and the Wills and all these people are just, are they really conservative at all? They just, uh, they, they might be a little more uh, on the right than than your typical leftist, but they're not really that conservative. So, um that split, of course, that, that dispute is really going to cleave the conservative movement in many ways because um, the paleos, the Bradfordites, so the, the people that were considered that, even Chronicles, they kind of become fringe. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the mainstream becomes the neocons and then the West Coast Straussians ultimately and the East Coast Straussians and all these people that are that they get into the system and they're able to, uh, to get positions of power and um, all the people like us. We're on the outside looking in. Talk a little bit about the literary um, and maybe the cultural contributions of the South. You know, aside, we talk all about political theory and some of those things, but the South has an, an independent and important cultural contribution to America. Absolutely. I mean, um, again, I'll, I'll refer back to, to the 1930s, and there was some discussion of this uh, with the, the fugitive agrarians. Um, they're an important part of, of America's cultural heritage, but Southern, the Southern component of that. And, um, and this essay that Donald Davidson wrote, Donald Davidson, of course, a very great poet, literary figure. I mean, just tremendous, uh, tremendous voice for the South said, look, the problem is 
uh, we've everybody in the South has adopted this kind of you know northern view that you have to be very critical of the South, and if you're not sufficiently critical enough, um, you're going to be ostracized. You're not going to get any money. You're, but he's saying poets have a way because nobody reads poetry anyway. So poets can be very critical, and right. we can do whatever we want, and and we can really be good stewards of the South. But when you look at the cultural tradition of the South and you think about literature. We often focus on New England, and I mean there are there are interesting New England authors, but uh, some of the best are Southerners. I mean, people like Faulkner. I mentioned the fugitive agrarians, but Eudora Welty. I mean, there there are all kinds of people out there that uh, we could say are embody the South. Edgar Allan Poe, uh, who hated New England. I mean, when you look at his time editing uh, in the in the antebellum period, ed- editing uh, his his uh, literary magazine. Um, he hates New Englanders. He cannot stand them. He thinks that their their, their literature is subpar um, <laughs> and that people should be paying attention to the South. People like William Gilmore Sims and ultimately, you know, someone like Henry Tim, Tim Rod or Frank Tickner, or James Ryder Randall. I mean, some of these important individuals who are I mean, almost lost to time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, uh, Sidney Lanier and, and some of these people. So um, there is a rich literary tradition there, but the way that the South really wins, of course, is music. And we've just had a big conversation about that recently because of Beyonce Knowles' new album, uh, Cowboy Carter. And is that cultural appropriation or is it something else? Uh, I have a colleague that'll tell you this. Almost every genre of music you can think about in, in the United States has a Southern root. Mm-hmm. And so the South wins that way. I mean, this is where you don't have American music without Southern music, maybe except for polka or something like that. But um, it doesn't exist. Uh, you find the Southern roots of all of this. And so when he said, look, when Beyonce made this album, it's not a country album. It's a Southern album. It's a Beyonce album more than anything else. But it's a Southern album because it has this kind of Southern root to it. And she's from the South. She's from Texas. So you have that. Uh, we're, we all look at it in very ideological, distorted ways because we don't really understand their tradition, and that's important. And I think that people have an agenda without without question in both both respects. But he's looking at it as a position in the article I'm referring to. Well, now uh, this is something that's southern. It's it's something that the South has been doing forever. I mean, Ray Charles had a country album. Mm-hmm. Uh, he had you know an album recorded country songs and made them sound like Ray Charles, and that was fine, and nobody cared. Um, it, that stuff has been going on for years. It's just that now because of the hyper, uh, you know, cancel culture, woke, all these things, we, we focus on that stuff uh, when we really shouldn't. So, um, but uh, to answer, to finish up your question, I mean, without the South in terms of a cultural heritage, um, we wouldn't have some of the richness of the arts that we do in America with literature and music by far architecture. I mean, there's, there's several other things too. Mm-hmm. This is a this is a tough question, but um, who are your some some of your favorite twentieth century Southern writers that really kept the the spirit and memory of the South alive? It's not a hard question. I mean, Richard Weaver is fantastic. Um, the Southern tradition at bay should be required reading for any conservative. I don't care if you're from the North or the South, or what if you're a West Coast Strausian, East Coast Strausian, a uh, paleoconservative, neoconservative. You should read the Southern tradition at bay to simply understand what this is. Um, and Weaver wrote that book. It's about post the postbellum South. And uh, when I was talking to, to, uh, to Clyde Wilson years ago, we had a discussion about Southern history and, and what, what, uh, what he would do again. He told me, he said, look, if I, maybe if I had to do it up again, I would study the postbellum South because that's the key. Uh, you know, the antebellum South is great. Calhoun's great. The founders are great. All that's fantastic. We win all that. But in the postbellum South, when you have to actually start thinking about these things and what it, what the South meant, that's what the Southern tradition at Bay is. It, it does. I mean, it, it's essential in that way. Also, the uh, Liberty Fund put out a collection of Weaver's essays, mm-hmm. uh, uh, the Southern essays of Richard Weaver, which is very good. Uh, Mel Bradford, of course, is excellent. Uh, Remembering Who We Are is a fantastic book. You can get that. Um, a uh, better guide than reason is also very good, but one that's easy to get is uh, his book on the founding fathers. It's, it's fantastic, or original intention, which is his book on the Constitution. All those are very good. Um, I would say you know those two, but I mean, gosh, Clyde Wilson, of course, anything you can read of Clyde uh, is excellent as well, and he's been writing for for years. Um, 
know, Joseph Scotchy is very good. Uh, you know, Tom Fleming of Chronicles. I mean, gosh, read Tom Fleming. Uh, mm -hmm. Fleming. Uh, there was a, a really good book, um, uh, um, the New Right Papers that Fleming wrote in, uh, which is excellent. Uh, the um, Clyde edited a book that has uh, an essay by Tom Fleming in it. You know, why the South will survive. Uh, still in print at uh, University of Georgia Press. So you've got these these figures uh, in the in the late twentieth century that and, and it, we're a long time affiliated with Chronicles that have really tried to keep that Southern tradition alive, or at least have it be a part of what it means to be an American conservative. And um, I hope that we can continue that into the future. My last question is: Do you think the South will survive, or do you think um, things are just so distorted and there's you know, sort of a trend of disinterest and in, in shutting down that memory of the South with all the statues and flags and all the politicization of, of the South? Do you think it's uh, survivable? I think it's on life support. I'm not even sure if the tradition, if you're thinking about an essay written in 1932, of someone like uh, Donald Davis who would recognize where the South is today. I don't, I don't think he would. Mm -hmm. That that South is probably gone. Uh, the the agrarian South that uh, was uh, so resistant to consumerism, at least in his mind, and industrialization. I mean, Southerners have adopted all that stuff. They like McDonald's too, and they want to shop at Walmart, which of course is a Southern company, but at least it was originally. Mm -hmm. So Southerners have, have embraced these parts of it. I think that there's parts of the Southern tradition that can survive. I would hope that the art, the artistic part of it can survive. Um, if people uh, were, were still have interest in it, um, the political side of it, I think, is making a, a resurgence when you ask about nullification, these issues of decentralization. I think that part of it is still there uh, because Americans understand that's a fundamental thing. I mean, self-determination, um, you know, we, we should have a, a federation of states. Those kind of principles are always floating around out there. So I think it's on life support. And as, as the left continues to tear stuff down, um, you're going to start seeing it less and less. But on the other hand, uh, this happened in Ireland. And, I, and um, you look at the period of time when, when it was illegal to have the green flag in Ireland. Um, and now it's not. And they just went underground. And, and they said, as long as we can write the songs and sing the songs, we're going to be okay. And so as long as we can continue to write about these things and at least talk about them, if it's, if it's something valuable and worthwhile, People will find it eventually, and they'll come back to it. Uh, so it can be. I mean, it, it, we're we're facing you know a, a darker time period. I think, and I, I want to be optimistic and say that um, what what we're doing matters, and I think it does. Um, but I think it can it will get worse for a time before it actually does get better. Though I do see some hope. I mean, some places have started to say, "Yeah, we're not going to take these monuments down. Yeah, we're not going to do this. We're we're gonna we're gonna hold back some of this stuff a little bit." And we're going to rethink about these things. Um, and I, I think that's a positive. Uh, there, are, But like I said, there are some parts of the Southern tradition, I think, that are easier to hang on to than others. And hopefully those will uh, will, will stay current and, and uh, people will find value in them moving forward. Good. I like that answer. Um, where can people find you? You have your McClanahan Academy. You can talk about that and maybe some of the books. You can pitch some of your books. Sure. Uh, of course, uh, abbyvalinstitute.org. I'm the president of the Institute now. So um, that's a great place. If you're interested in the South and the Southern tradition, it's a great organization. Uh, uh, hundreds of scholars affiliated with it who want to talk about the South and the tradition. Uh, but also my own personal webpage, brianmcclanahan.com, Brian with an O. Uh, all of my books are available at amazon.com or Barnes and Noble. Just look my name up. But um, I've got my podcast. You can, you can uh, come on over to the Brian McClanahan show. It's either on YouTube or on Patreon, you can get it there uh, if you want to become a patron of the show. Uh, but I mean, I do appreciate anybody that wants to come and check me out anywhere online, uh, social media as well, you know, Twitter, Facebook, wherever it is. So I'm on those places as well. So I'd love to, to hear from you and have a conversation. Well, the last uh, listener comment was that Brian McClanahan was the man who brought me to the authentic right. So you've got fans out there and I hope everyone checks you out. But thanks for joining me today. I appreciate it.